Welcome back to our Apes Flipped Classroom. And today we are talking about different ways that we can reduce air pollutants. So we've been talking about the criteria pollutants. We've been talking about indoor and outdoor air pollutants. And then we've been delving into the specifics of sources of emission of each of those pollutants. And today we're gonna to talk about different ways that we can reduce the amount of air pollutants that are emitted. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about in terms of um, reducing pollutants is simply reducing emissions because if we reduce emissions, then by extension, we're automatically going to be reducing air pollutants. So how can we reduce our emissions? Drive less. That's probably the number one for most Americans is driving less and either walking or biking or carpooling or taking the bus more often. Um, because our cars are one of our primary sources of emissions. We can conserve electricity, whether that's by using smart appliances, turning off um, lights and appliances when they're not being used, um, trying to reduce our phantom energy use, anything we can do to conserve electricity. Eating more plants and less meat is going to reduce emissions from um, agriculture. And then using renewable or non-pollution emitting energy. So those are things like solar, wind, and hydroelectric power. Even using um, nuclear power is going to help reduce emissions because although nuclear has its own issues with um, solid waste, it generally speaking is not an um, emitter of pollution. Okay, so we have a lot of laws and regulations on the book that help to try to reduce pollutants. So obviously the first one that pertains to our atmospheric pollutants is the Clean Air Act. This was enacted in the 1970s and it allows the EPA to set acceptable levels for those criteria air pollutants. Remember those are specifically those six criteria air pollutants and that's what's addressed in the Clean Air Act. The EPA therefore monitors emission levels from power plants and other facilities. They work with departments of environmental quality in different states in order to set levels and then uh, make sure that those are being adhered to. If corporations release emissions above their agreed to levels, then those corporations can be taxed, they can be fined, they can be sued depending on um, what the agreement states. Okay, another set of regulations which also fall under the EPA is what we call the CAFE vehicle standards. Um, so CAFE stands for Corporate Average Fuel Economy. So these are standards that require the whole fleet of vehicles from a particular company to meet a certain average fuel economy. So we talk about CAFE standards, it's not setting standards for sedans or for trucks, it's setting standards for an entire company. So say Ford Motor Company or GM or Toyota. And so vehicle manufacturers are going to work to make more efficient vehicles across their whole range of vehicles that they sell. And so you'll sometimes see companies trying to offset um, sort of gas guzzler vehicles by producing more um, efficient, smaller vehicles. But on the whole, it does help to reduce um, the number of emissions because these more efficient vehicles are going to burn less gasoline and they're going to release less nitrogen oxides, less particulate matter, and less carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. So um, definitely a way to reduce the emissions from vehicles. Okay, and then the last thing is pollution credits. So these work similarly to like quotas in the fishing industry. So the EPA set levels, if there are companies that reduce emissions well below those levels, they actually earn credits and they can sell those credits to other companies. And those other companies that are above their acceptable levels, this is a way for them to get down below acceptable levels. So um, this is a way for to incentivize using the free market, having companies reduce their emissions because they can actually make money off of selling those credits. Uh, so it's a combination of regulations and free market economy. 
Okay, when it comes to reducing vehicle air pollutants, so now we're not talking about emission or about efficiency standards, but actually reducing the pollutants that the vehicles are putting out. So um, this is sort of off to the side of vehicles, it's not the vehicles themselves, but there are mandated at all gas stations are something called vapor recovery nozzles. And vapor recovery nozzles try to capture those hydrocarbon VOCs from the gasoline fuels during refueling. So there's actually a tube within the nozzle that captures those vapors and returns them back to the storage tank under the gas station. This is gonna reduce those volatile organic compounds, which you remember are a key contributor to photochemical smog and which in and of themselves irritate respiratory tracts. Um, benzene is also one of these VOCs and benzene is a known carcinogen. So this also helps to limit the amount of benzene that is released from gasoline vapors. Now on the vehicles themselves, um, we have catalytic converters. So a catalytic converter is required on all vehicles 1975 and forward. Um, and it's a ceramic honeycomb inside a stainless steel case. It is coated usually with platinum, palladium, and rhodium catalysts. And those catalysts um, facilitate electron transfer to reduce um, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, and other hydrocarbons to carbon dioxide, which is much less harmful to humans than the carbon monoxide, which we remember is an asphyxiant. Um, it reduces the nitrogen oxides to nitrogen, which we remember is one of the standard components of our atmosphere and oxygen and water. So by converting to those, there are still, carbon dioxide is still a greenhouse gas, it still contributes to global warming. So it's still an environmental concern, but it is much less of a human health concern than carbon monoxide. And by converting the nitrogen oxides to nitrogen, um, we are reducing the potential for acid rain. Okay, so reducing sulfur, dia sulfur oxides and nitrous oxides. Um, in order to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions from um, combustion of coal, one of the most common things that's added is crushed limestone. So the crushed coal that's going into the boiler is actually gonna get mixed with crushed limestone or calcium carbonate. Um, the limestone won't burn, the coal will, but the calcium carbonate in the limestone is actually going to combine with sulfur dioxide. And that will produce calcium sulfate, which traps the sulfur dioxide, prevents the sulfur dioxide from being emitted, thereby reducing the emission of that particular pollutant. As a side benefit, that calcium sulfate can actually be used to make um, what we call sheetrock or gypsum wallboard. So calcium sulfate is gypsum and it is a raw material for building products. So um, in order to reduce nitrogen oxides in coal combustion, one of the common methods is what they call fluidized bed combustion. So in fluidized bed combustion, um, jets of pre-warmed air are pumped into that combustion bed, which again will often contain both coal and limestone. This brings more oxygen into the reaction, which results in more efficient combustion, more complete combustion. And in addition, it brings that sulfur oxide into contact with the calcium carbonate in the limestone, thereby trapping the sulfur dioxide more efficiently but it also allows coal to be combusted at a lower temperature and still achieve complete combustion, which means that it's going to emit less nitrogen oxides. And so the combination of crushed limestone and fluidized bed combustion reduces both sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. Okay, if we're not using fluidized combustion, bed combustion, or even if we are, we still often employ both wet and dry scrubbers. And so a dry scrubber is one where you have a column or a tube or a pipe that is filled with um, usually powdered or crushed chemicals 
that are going to absorb or neutralize those oxides, nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxide, VOCs from our exhaust streams. So one of the common dry scrubber additives is calcium oxide, which again is gonna react with sulfur dioxide to form calcium sulfite. Okay, so we have here an image of a dry scrubber and you can see the gas coming in from the exhaust pipe and then going through the uh, media that is designed to trap those oxides. Um, again, depending on what the um, exhaust gas is and what they're trying to trap, that media might be made of different materials. So the other type of scrubber is what we call a wet scrubber. And so a wet scrubber is usually involving chemical agents that can absorb or neutralize um, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, or VOCs, but they can also include mist nozzles that trap particulate matter in water droplets. So wet scrubbers are very commonly used when you have um, both particulate matter and exhaust gases that you wanna trap. So by misting, um, those pollutants are trapped they fall to the bottom of the scrubber or they potentially get trapped at the top. There's something at the top called a mist eliminator that's designed to prevent any of this from going out through um, the exhaust system. That water is then trapped or captured in a sludge collection system and the water can then be disposed of, neutralized and disposed of. So dry scrubbers, if you don't have a lot of particulate matter, wet scrubbers, if you have both exhaust gases that you want to deal with and particulate matter. Another way of reducing particulate matter is something called an electrostatic precipitator. So with an electrostatic precipitator, um, the particulates are passed through a um, negatively charged electrode, which gives all of those particles a negative charge and then they pass through a series of positively charged collection plates, and those are trapped. Those trap those negatively charged particles. Um, every now and then the power is turned off to those plates, so they are discharged, and those particles fall down into a collection hopper where they can then be disposed of in a landfill. So um, electrostatic precipitators are used very often for particulate matter. And then the third type of particulate matter um, system is what's called a bag house filter. Um, and these literally are what they sound like. They are fabric bags that trap particulate matter. Um, the air from the industrial process is passed through the bag house filters and the particulate matter is trapped. Uh, there's a system called a shaker that then shakes these bags so that the particulate matter falls down into the collection hopper and the particulate matter is collected and taken to a landfill. Okay, so here's your practice FRQ for this one. I'd like you to make a claim about the effectiveness of the CAFE standards passed under the Obama administration as an effort to reduce the levels of nitrogen oxides in urban areas. And then you have a figure here that gives you the impact of these cafe rollbacks on fuel economy. And I want you to justify your claim using that data. As always, let me know if you have any questions and I look forward to seeing you in class.